Hi, everybody. Um, so we just talked a little bit about thermal, and that's really what we're going to be getting into with Heather. Um, maybe. Oh, I pressed the wrong one. There we go. Okay, so my name's Sydney Schnulo. I'm the aircraft conceptual modeling lead on Heather. Um, Heather stands for High Efficiency Electric Air Electrified Aircraft Thermal Research. Our PI is Ralph Jansen, and our co-PI is Kevin Ancliffe. So we're looking to solve the challenges to make electrified aircraft propulsion possible. Uh, why do we want to make it possible? Basically, we want to be able to reduce emissions in our current fleets and also expand to different markets uh, with electric aircraft propulsion. So for commercial markets, we already have a very strong commercial market that's only growing. So we are looking to reduce emissions and fuel burn there. We might be able to enable more regional flights with a shorter distance and less passengers if we have more hybrid operations. And then with urban air mobility, we can now start to enable uh, vertical takeoff and landing vehicles that are also efficient at cruise with distributed electric propulsion. The problem we are going to focus in on with electrified aircraft propulsion is thermal management. So the statement I have here is current electrified aircraft concepts produce large amounts of low grade waste heat that require large, heavy thermal management systems that cause drag. So this is kind of the problem statement that we're going to talk about today. Um, and I want to just break that down so that we all kind of understand the intricacies of that. So the first part, we have these large amounts of waste heat, of low grade waste heat to manage. What does low grade waste heat mean? Um, so this is a typical uh, DC transmission system where you have your generator, you have an AC to DC rectifier, you have DC circuit breakers, you have your DC to AC inverter, and then you have your motor. State of the art today, we are about 95% efficient, which is great. Um, but that means that 5% of the efficiency at each of these uh, steps goes to heat. So when you go down that whole transmission, we're losing 20% of our energy to heat. The other thing that we have to consider there is that our generators, our converters, and our motors have relatively low temperature limits. So we have temperature limits of about 150 C. So we have that means that we don't have a lot of uh, delta T to play with to reject that heat, which makes thermal management more challenging. Um, also, if we're losing 20% of our energy to heat, that's very already very cost effective or already very penalizing to aircraft in general. That's very mass uh, sensitive. Um, but when we look at a hybrid solution or a fully electric solution where batteries are already very heavy, uh, that means we're carrying m more batteries than we are able to produce into energy. And this problem is going to go across all the markets I talked about earlier, from urban air mobility to short haul to commercial. All of these vehicles will have hundreds of kilowatts of waste heat that we still need to manage. So the second part of this is how do we actually manage that heat? Uh, so we have to think about kind of three major things when we are looking at thermal management systems that will penalize the aircraft as a whole, and that is mass. Uh, drag and power usage. So we have a few options. We could come up with a whole new thermal management technology, um, but we, in Heather, do not have the time or money to do that. So we'll go to the next one. So fluid cooling, where we're using uh, conventional heat exchangers uh, to to reject the heat. So that's going to cost us some mass for the uh, heat exchangers. We might have drag from taking ram air in to be one of our heat transfer fluids. And then uh, power we will use to, for the pumps of the, uh, of the cooling fluid. For air cooling, we could put heat sink fins out in the airstream, but that's going to cause drag. 
So what we want to consider with Heather is outer mold line cooling. So use the skin that is already there on the aircraft to reject heat to the, to the environment. So our idea is to be able to enable this by reducing our losses by 75%. Um, so our CFD team has looked at, uh, this is our Stark Able aircraft, and identified the areas on the aircraft where we can get the most, uh, the most uh, heat out. So basically, where is our convection coefficient the highest along the aircraft? The blue on here, I don't know how to use this. Here we go, okay. So the blue on here, this is for a state-of-the-art power system. Really, the point I'm trying to make is there's a lot of blue here. We would need a lot of area to reject the heat for the state-of-the-art system. For a power system with four times lower heat, we have a lot less blue. Uh, so how do we get to this four times less power, or four times less losses? We are going to be eliminating half of those conversion steps, so that's half of the steps where we are losing that 5% uh, of heat, and then we're gonna make extremely low loss components. What's that look like? So in the gray, we have our conventional DC power transmission system, um, and then in the green box, we have what our proposed Heather system looks like. So we still have our generator, but now we have an AC to AC converter, so that takes away the losses that would come from, the losses and the weight that would come from an AC to DC uh, rectifier and a DC to AC converter, or inverter, and just put that together into one, uh, one piece of hardware. And then we have our motor. We have some pretty ambitious goals for losses for the Heather system. Um, but basically we're trying to get down to less than 5% of the heat. So overall a 95% efficient, pow efficient power transmission system. At the aircraft level, uh, this is gonna bring down the penalties of electric, air, electrified aircraft propulsion. We'll have a heat reduction of 75%, which reduces the, will reduce the power system weight by 40%. Um, and then the thermal management system weight is reduced by 60%. We're actually building, designing and building these components that we're talking about are two key technologies being developed. The first is the high efficiency megawatt motor. Um, I'll call it HEM probably from here on. <laughs> um, so, and then we also have our AC to AC converter. So we'll go through those two technologies and talk about how we have been working in Heather to develop those. So HEM, the key performance goals are that we want it to be 99% efficient and 16 kilowatts per kilogram of specific power. And there's three major technologies that are going to enable this. First is we have a superconducting rotor um, so superconducting motors have been around for a while. Uh, the, the thing here is that we now have this rotating cryocooler that sits in the shaft of the, of the motor, and this will cool the, cool the rotor so that we can get down to superconducting temperatures, and that will reduce the losses. Uh, so the root, rotating cryocooler means that we don't need to have the cryogenic system on the aircraft, and that just makes it a more practical machine. Then we also have this slotless stator, which will reduce, or reduce the ripple current on the motor. So we've been testing these subsystems uh, separately to start to understand our feasibility of the motor. Um, so the first thing is the rotor. We took a subsection of the rotor. So here we have the right stack length on the rotor in the left picture. Um, it'll be a little longer, but what we did is we took that sample and we basically dipped it in li liquid hydrogen of, or liquid nitrogen a bunch of times and uh, cooled it down, brought it back to room temperature, and measured the uh, the current running through it. So if you can see on the right, we have our number of thermal cycles on the x-axis and then the current on the y-axis. Um, and what we were able to find, if you see that the, um, the, the, 
the scale on the axis is pretty pretty small. So we didn't have a lot of detectable degradation on the rotor through these thermal cycles. Um, so the next step with the rotor is to make sure that it can withstand the stress of, sp of spinning uh, at 6,800 RPM. For the stator, we also built a section of the stator, um, and that's shown here on the left. Um, one of the big things with the stator is that we need to have really good contact between the epoxy and the coils so that we have the right thermal conductivity because our thermal management of the stator at the required current is very challenging. Um, so the potting process here was really kind of worked out um, and we were able to run this, this subsection of the stator uh, and cool, keep it under its temperature limits at its full current. Um, the next step with the stator is that we will be building the full stator, which requires us to pot it in a vertical uh, orientation, whereas here we were at a, um, here we potted it horizontally. So with the hem motor, the we also are working on testing the cryo cooler. So that is in progress right now. They probably were testing it today. Um, so. TBD on those results there. Uh, so now we have the AC to AC converter. So this work has been fully done within this first year of Heather. Um, our performance goals here is that we want to be 99% efficient and uh, achieve 10 kilowatts per kilogram. The way we're going to do this, the big innovations is that we're, we, basically there's much better switches than there have been in the past. So we're using the most advanced silicon carbide uh, FETs. We are interleaving to allow large amounts of uh, power switches. So this allows us to have a higher frequency uh, on each switch, which will uh, uh, increase the efficiency of the motor as a whole. And then we have this multi-level topology, uh, which will reduce the voltage drop uh, per switch. Uh, so the progress here is we have our uh, concept design, and we've been able to get it to a point where we are, we are able to see that we can reach our performance goals. So we have in the first chart, the first graph, our goal is in the uh, dotted gray line, and we want to get below that, and we see that with our switch frequency to be around 30, we can, we can achieve that. Um, with the loss goal there, um, depending on the switch rate that we are using, um, we are able to also get below the losses, so, or before, below our goal. So we have identified a topology that we are gonna continue improving on, um, but we kind of have a, we're able to see that we are close to our goals there. So the Heather team, obviously there's not just me working on this project, there's a, a bunch of us. Um, and we're spread across all the different centers, or all the different aero centers. So we're at Glenn, Langley, Armstrong, and Ames. We also have a lot of external partners. Uh, we have Aurora, Flight Sciences, UTRC, Parker Aerospace, and PC Krause. So we've been working with them and uh, in the development of both the hardware and then the aircraft conceptual modeling tools. Really our big products within Heather are technology development and transition. And we do that in three different ways. One, a big one we've been trying to do is publication. So in the past, in the first year of our execution, we published six papers, and I know there's at least two or three more that are in for upcoming conferences. We have a patent for both the hem motor and another patent for the uh, AC to AC converter. So that helps to transfer, transition us to industry. And then the last one is a part that I didn't talk about as much, but within Heather, kind of we have been developing tools to start to be able to do aircraft conceptual modeling that really includes uh, the electric system and the thermal, thermal management system in a way that we haven't done before. So that's all I had to say. Uh, I, it looks like I have 20 seconds left, so just on time. <laughs> um, thank you for listening, and we'll go ahead and...
take questions. Thank you. Yeah, I just texted my wife and told her her boss did a good job, so I don't get into trouble at home. <laughs> did, you, did you tell her that you did a good job? Yeah. <laughs> she won't believe me, don't worry. <laughs> um, let's find out, you know. All right, so thank you, Sydney. Thank you. Let's see. Do we have, who do we want to start with? So you seem like you've got a pretty well-defined approach with you know specific targets to how you want to achieve it, all of this. You've done some of the work, but where do you see the biggest risks and the challenges? You've got some ways to go. So the biggest risks, um, the the rotating cryo cooler that I spoke about, uh, we that's that's very challenging. We're using uh, actually acoustic waves to get down to cryogenic temperatures. Um, so, and it has to spin at 6,800 RPM. So there has been a company that has done it up to, done the same kind of thing up to 1,200 RPM. So we see the path there, um, but I mean, obviously 6,800 is much more than 1,200. So um, that, that's, that's a big risk on the HEM motor. Um, the converter has a lot, at all three of the things that I, uh, kind of spoke about for the converter are are challenging. So we are taking an approach where we're not doing, first we're building a inverter, so it's not a AC to AC, it's a um, DC to AC system to start to just bring down, just learn what we need to do to get to the efficiencies at that, at that level, and then be able to scale it up to the 1.4 megawatts that we're trying to do for AC to AC. And, and just one comment, you said that some of the IP you've developed for modeling, mm -hmm. um, so that might have broader applicability, by the way, if you're interested. I mean, even places like data centers, I think they, send two, they spend $2 for every dollar of power that they supply. Uh, I don't know, I haven't a clue what they use to, to model their systems, but that's a huge area. Um, and if you've got a modeling technique that you think has some innovation and, and uh, uniqueness, I, I think that's probably got broader applicability. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I agree. I don't know how unique our models are as far as obviously the physics, and there's a lot of yeah. power system modeling out there. Um, I think that the biggest, thing is getting our aircraft and propulsion models to talk to our thermal management models and our um, and our electric system models and get those all to talk together so that we can uh, do kind of these conceptual aircraft level designs that have been that NASA has been doing for a while and they look like they have benefit but we really need to start like getting into the weeds there and understanding okay if we start to put better numbers on the thermal and the electric system, how, how much better can we get it? Okay. I think the, uh, the, the AC switching technology that you described is really interesting. Can you talk a little bit about um, the feedback from your partners that you had along the way in the development of this and where you see potential additional applications of it? I can try. <laughs> um, so I, I'm not super involved in the converter uh, design, but they have been working. We've been we've been talking to actually X57, not a commercial partner, but X57 within NASA, um, and we're actually our what we're calling our in risk reduction inverter is sized for X57. So um, that's that's a potential way to transition 
to one of their small businesses uh, that they're working with. X57 is working with a lot of different small businesses. Um, as far as the AC, AC to AC technology uh, specifically, I, I don't know how much conversation's been had there. Um, a, a couple of questions, actually. So, so first off, I, I thought it was very well thought out. I kept thinking of the questions I might I wanted to know more about, and then you would answer it in the next, <laughs> next statement. But, uh, um, so the cryo cooler, uh, really interesting. You know, the, the, the cryogenic is, is a hard part of any sort of semiconducting system, right? Um, have you looked at other applications beyond this one for where, where the cryo cooler might go? Um, I, I know you said it's your highest risk, you've got a long way to go. But have you, have you talked to others about it? Have you looked at other applications beyond just this one? Again, I'm not very sure. Um, the I know, well, just so a big innovation within the cryo cooler is the use of acoustic waves. Mm -hmm. um, and we are starting to spool up a couple other things that will use acoustic waves to uh, basically take energy from, or take heat from the thermal management of parts of the aircraft and use that as useful energy somewhere else. Um, so that's something that has been talked about within, and, and that's an effort that's getting spooled up uh, at NASA. Um, but as far as the cryo cooler itself, um, I'm not aware of any of that. So, so on, on not quite a related note, but, but mm -hmm. again, looking at, at how you're talking to others and, and looking at transition, and, and, and which is always a great thing with these things, you noted that you've got you secured patents on the motor? Yes. And you secured patents on the, uh, on the uh, converters, right? Y yes. Um, are you talking to folks about how you might, you know, what, what is your plan with that? Are you going to license that? Uh, are you talking to folks who are interested in licensing that technology? What, what's your plan then to leverage the, what you've got there in terms of IP mm -hmm. um, and, and do something with that? Um, so our plan for the motor, it would be great when we build it in the next year, if we can take it out to like NEAT or something and be able to test it. Um, I think that's, that's something that, some kind of follow on effort where we can actually go out to NEAT and test it. Um, we've been working with Parker Aerospace, which uh, develops motors and um, it would be great if we could work with them to kind of pass it on there. They've, I think, been they've been just part of the kind of been aware of our design process the whole time so as it matures and we as we can mature it to a point where a company could take it and be like okay the, you guys got this to work now we'll we'll take it on um i think i think getting to that point is the most important point for us to start getting it out into industry Oh, okay. Great. Okay, let's start with the second one, blown wings. Oh, okay. That seems shorter. <laughs> oh, okay. Wait, this is a good question. It's objectively shorter than the So blown wings, like your tilt wing, look like they have a good promise of surface cooling. Do some aircraft have be better applicability? Actually, the tilt wing, because it's vertical takeoff and landing, is our harder case for outer mold line cooling. Because when you're taking off, that's your, you're using three times the power of when you're cruising. So that's three times the heat of when you're cruising. Um, and you don't have a lot of airflow over those wings. So that's actually the harder case. Um, but things like uh, the commercial aircraft, we get a good amount of, uh, a good amount of air flowing over the wings and something like, yeah, something like the X57, we should get a, a good amount. That would be a good outer mold line cooling case. And they're actually doing that. So uh, the converter, a lot of the converter work has stemmed from uh, Glenn, the team, or a lot of the team that we have at Glenn working on the converter worked on the motor controllers for the high lift motors, so the smaller motors um, on X57. So those smaller motors are completely outer mold line cooled. So that's kind of where the idea came from um, for this project.
Okay, for the first question, um, have you integrated the HEM and AC to AC converter in a system simulation to see if your modeling provides what you think you should achieve? Are you looking at putting the system together to verify your design? Um, yes, so most of the work that has been done in this project has been modeling uh, with different design tools. So, and the, the converter and HEM are being developed very closely together so that uh, we can reduce the losses between the two. Um, and so that's, that's probably most of the work that's been done here is, is, is that modeling. So let me let me kind of poke at the um, at the uh, conversion process there because you know um, you're going to instead of you're going to eliminate the DC convert the the AC to DC and the DC to AC right so so what challenge does that pose ostensibly there's a reason why you would convert to DC right but now you're not going to do it so that's going to raise some other challenges in terms of pushing AC current around an airplane so what kind of challenges does that pose and how do you how do you see that um, being resolved, or or how do you see managing that going? If you were to use this kind of a system, yeah, that's a good question. So, so the challenge is there. So there's a few things. Um, the first thing is we have uh, usually with DC, you're you like DC transmission to reduce the arcing across the lines. Um, so this is still something that we are kind of working out how, how, how you end up actually getting rid of that. But something when you go from the DC to the AC is we uh, actually increase the number of y like cables um, because we're going up to nine phases and each phase has I think we're we're setting it at two cables, uh, and so the actual weight of the wire can reduce, um, so we can manage that kind of insulation a little bit better. Um, so that's a big thing as far as the AC to AC conversion. Um, that's a lot of electrical engineering that I don't <laughs> I don't have the background to speak on, um, but I can get Dave or Ralph to let you know more about that. All right. Anything else? You can get it to the end of the day. Did I put everyone to sleep? No, no, no. <laughs> it's it's AC D C music, we can start, you know. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you.